Good morning. My name is Gloria Beam. I'm from Crested Butte, Colorado. Wish I was with you guys today. I'm very excited to be presenting to you today. And I'm going to be talking about 3D printing for casting and splinting in a sports medicine practice. I'm going to be going over the evolution of splinting and casting, and it's actually quite interesting. Here are my disclosures. Still excited to uh, present my message here. Uh, I've had the incredible experience of um, doing a lot of international sports. Um, I've been with the cycling team for 15 years. I have been with the U U.S. ski team, uh, and I've traveled with the uh, U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee for seven different games. So I've had a lot of fun with that. All right, so let's start from way back when, 3000 before the common era. Excavations of tombs from the 5th dynasty revealed splinting techniques. In 1600 BCE, ancient Egyptians wrapped injuries in linen, stiffened from embalming techniques. And in 350 BCE, Hippocrates described casting, the first casting, with bandages soaked in wax and resin. And then in the first thousand years of the Common Era, there were casts made out of calcium oxide and egg whites. And in the Middle Ages, they would use horse's blood and they would soak bandages to stiffen up <laughs> uh, splints for those poor guys on the battlefield. Fortunately, we don't use those techniques anymore, at least I don't. In the 1800s, the modern cast was developed by French military surgeons. And in 1875, Hugh Owens Thomas, he was a Welsh surgeon, actually a third generation surgeon, devised the Thomas splint. I'm sure all of you have heard of that because there's a lot of renditions that are still available today that take uh, away from the Thomas splint. In the First World War, his nephew, Thomas's nephew, Sir Robert Jones, uh, he used the Thomas splint and helped reduce open femur fracture mortality from 80% to less than 8%. Pretty amazing. Now, there's certainly bad things that can happen if you don't splint or cast properly. You can compress nerves, blood vessels, muscles, skin, and other soft tissues and get a really bad result. You can also aggravate the underlying injury. And if you have a life-threatening condition, don't forget your ABCs and make a beautiful splint. Forget the splint, get that patient <laughs> help. But you don't wanna delay transport of a patient with a life-threatening condition. Plaster of Paris, well, that is a starch-based cast. Uh, this was standard treatment uh, in the 18th and 19th century, and it really didn't change much for quite a while. In the early 19th century, they would pour Plaster of Paris around an injured limb encased in a wooden construct. The problem with these is they were incredibly heavy and you couldn't really move the patients around. And it wasn't until 1839 where Lafargue used fresh warm starch paste mixed with plaster of Paris powder and he applied it to layers of linen strips and it reduced the setting time of this to six hours which is pretty long. Can you imagine one of your patients sitting in your clinic for six hours? Finally the Dutch military surgeon Matheson in 1852 he soaked plaster of Paris in water hardened within minutes, providing sufficient casting for injured limbs. So that's kind of the plaster of Paris we still use today. Plaster of Paris is calcium sulfate hydrogenated or gypsum. And the reason it's plaster of Paris, it was um, found, mostly gypsum was found near Paris. So that's what, how it got its name. When it's mixed with water, it causes a hyperthermic reaction, quickly sets to a hard porous mass, usually within five to 15 minutes. But it may take a couple days to be completely dry, so you don't want to bear weight on a plaster cast uh, until it's really dry, if it's weight bearing allowed. I've never seen an allergic reaction. I think they're pretty uncommon, but they have been reported. And the advantage of plaster of Paris is that it is radiolucent for x-rays, which makes it better than some type of metal splint. Now, if you're putting a cast on somebody, if they have neuropathy or a neurologic deficit, they're at greater risk of skin problems, of course. You have to be very careful when you roll the plaster bandages. If you stretch them, that's not the way to do it. You're supposed to just roll them on and then you massage the um, 
layers, bonds to layers, and ultimately makes the cast a little bit lighter. But you have to be careful. You don't want creases and ridges because that can cause a skin problem, especially if you have a patient with a neuropathy. Plaster bandages should be soaked in tepid or slightly warm water. You don't want it to be hot water because of the hypothermic reaction, you can cause a thermal burn. And interesting fact, if there's pre-existing plaster residue in the water, it can elevate the cast temperature significantly. So if you're gonna do multiple casts, you wanna change the water frequently. Fiberglass casts are next. They're lightweight, extremely strong. It's a fiber reinforced polymer made of a plastic matrix reinforced by fine glass. They're lightweight and more durable than plaster casts. They're three times stronger and one third the weight. I don't usually use these in the acute settings, however, because they're less accommodating to swelling and it's really hard to mold them. So if I have a kid with a both bone forearm fracture and I'm trying to do a closed reduction, I don't like using fiberglass, so plaster definitely works better. And when you do take the cast off, you have to be careful because sometimes glass can spray around in the air and get into your eyes. So be careful when you take those off. So when you do cast, uh, no matter what uh, you're using, complications can occur. So adults treated with a lower extremity cast for three weeks. There was two independent studies that found a DVT between 15 and 36% of the time. I think that's pretty extreme. In my practice, I think in 27 years here in Crested Butte and Gunnison and Telluride for that matter, um, I think I've seen three DVTs in lower extremity casts. Um, but that might be because I give everybody aspirin when they're in a cast, if there's no contraindication. But it can happen. Um, compartment syndrome, you can observe the car compartments very well when the cast is on, and it can be a very serious complication. You can get major loss of limb function and even amputation with a compartment syndrome. It's more common in the lower leg, but it can also occur in a forearm fracture. And I'm gonna give you one quick story uh, about a compartment syndrome. I was a sports medicine orthopedic fellow at University of Pittsburgh with the illustrious Dr. Fu, who I miss so much. Um, anyway, so this uh, football player, high school football, football player uh, presented to the emergency room. Uh, he injured his knee. The x-ray just showed a little tiny avulsion fracture. And for some reason, they put him in a cast, which sounds crazy. They sent him home. He came back to the ER twice with extreme pain. And rather than removing the cast uh, and checking for compartment syndrome, they just gave him more opiates and sent him home. He finally presented to our clinic and we took his cast off and he had pretty much a necrotic limb. He had had a knee dislocation, which was missed. Um, and because of that, he didn't get good vascularization to his limb. He developed compartment syndrome and in the cast, it was, it was not identified. And, this poor guy uh, lost his leg uh, as a result. So you gotta be careful when you cast people, you have to be observant and uh, if they're in pain, you have to listen to them. Uh, other complications, you can get soft tissue swelling. Fracture swelling is most significant usually within the first 48 hours. Um, and once it, uh, the, um, the swelling resolves, you can get loosening uh, in the cast, which can cause displacement of a reduced fracture. Padding is vital to prevent complications um, and it reduces uh, soft tissue swelling as well. Uh, if you have poor plastering techniques, poor padding or trimming techniques, you can get pressure sores. If you have foreign bodies, I found all kinds of things in cast, especially kids, pennies, marbles, action figures, <laughs> all kinds of stuff. Um, they often put stuff in there either to hide them or to uh, scratch an itch, but it can be dangerous. So. It's not good to find foreign bodies in a cast. And if you window, window a cast uh, for a wound, for example, it's very important to put that window back in because you can get swelling in the area of the window, which can cause problems at the skin margins. And you wanna be able to bivalve a cast so you can inspect uh, the soft tissues if you need to. Venous congestion can occur. You'll get swelling or blue discoloration, different from ecchymosis. You can get impaired venous return if the cast is too tight or if there's too much swelling. And then finally, cast saws. They can be scary to certain patients, especially kids, and they can cause injury. I've only seen one uh, burn like this from a cast saw uh, way back when, when I was a resident. I didn't do it, thank goodness. I would have felt horrible. 
um, but it can happen. So you have to be careful, make sure you have a good cast saw. And I always use the little magic sticks, those little plastic sticks you put under the uh, cast padding because it, uh, it's a little bit more comfortable and reassuring to the kids. So other problems when you have uh, casting, which uh, you can't remove, it can spread viruses. It's not very hygienic. It can trap moisture, which can, which can compromise the skin. It's not adjustable for swelling. You can't observe or treat underlying skin directly. The casts have to be sawed off and you can have some patient dissatisfaction and non-compliance. According to the NIH, over 10% of patients have extra office visits due to cast problems. This is um, on top that uh, reddish orange cast. I just saw this last week. Uh, this guy had a hand surgery somewhere else and he came to my clinic complaining of uh, severe tightness in his cast. And he actually went into his garage and used a hacksaw to cut this little window out. Um, I don't know how he didn't cut his skin, but um, I hate when people do that, when they try to cut their cast off by themselves. It's a bit dangerous. So now we're going to talk about 3D casting. That's why we're all here to discuss this, right? It's pretty cool stuff. So there used to be a scanner, but now you can use your phone. You can get an app on your phone and you uh, 3D scan uh, the cast that you want to build. So there's the scanning procedure. You can pick your colors. Here is the uh, production of the cast. And this is um, something that uh, soon will be done in the office. Uh, we're going to get a 3D uh, printer in our office very shortly. Cute dog. So the advantages with 3D um, casts and splints, they're more hygienic. It was really nice during COVID because people could wash their hands every 10 minutes and not worry about it. So they're waterproof. It can allow for the uh, skin or an incision if you uh, if it's post-operative to observe how they're looking. Uh, that can reduce infection rates. They can be adjustable for increased swelling that can reduce the incidence of compartment syndrome. They're breathable, which people really like. And they're adjustable if, if there's atrophy or decreased swelling. Um, and if you are trying to hold a, 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 redu a reduced fracture, it can reduce uh, the risk of malunions as well. In the meantime, between scanning and getting the 3D printed cast into your office, there's these trauma splints. And this uh, particular company offers these for free for the patient while they're waiting for the um, cast to be completed. So they just have zip ties. They, they pretty much are universal. They fit on everybody. They're waterproof. They're quite comfortable and they work quite well. Uh, before they had these, I had to just make um, temporary uh, plaster splints to hold the uh, fracture until the uh, device was available. Here's an uh, example of a snowboarder's elbow I took care of about a year ago. It was just a bag of bones. And it's nice because these 3D printed casts can be used for long arm casting as well. And they're removable. So as you know, when you fix an elbow like this, you want to get them moving early. So it's nice to have a waterproof uh, removable cast that's going to protect them, but also allow you to get them uh, early range of motion. It can also convert from a long arm to a short arm. So if you have a distal radius fracture and you want to lock the elbow for the first two or three weeks uh, to reduce uh, pronation supination, you can convert it into a short arm cast and then a splint. So the nice thing is you only need one device. You don't have to worry about having a long arm cast and then a short arm cast, and then a splint. So it's, it's kind of nice to get it all in one. Um, fortunately, most of the uh, insurance companies cover them as well. And I think they like the fact that they only have to pay for one cast rather than two or three uh, appliances. Here's a snowboarder wrist. So in my practice, I like uh, these 3D printed casts. They're lightweight. You can get them in different thicknesses. If you have a 60 year old, uh, lady that's just chilling and you're not worried about her, uh, you can get a thin um, uh, cast. And if it's some 16 year old wild man that's skiing through the trees, uh, you might want a thicker, more durable one. They're waterproof, you can swim, you can do water sports, you can shower, um, you can wash your hands every 10 minutes for COVID. <laughs> um, so they're hygienic. It reduces skin problems because you can keep an eye on the skin. You can scratch an itch, so less likely to find, um, you know, little toys or, or pencils or pennies in the cast. Easy to use bone stimulator. So let's say you have a scaphoid fracture. You're concerned maybe you're going to have a problem with union. 
uh, particularly in a smoker, for instance, you can build in one of these holes when you're making the cast to make sure it's going to be right over the scaphoid so you can put a bone stimulator on it if you need to. Uh, the cast converts into a splint. Way better patient compliance. I've been using these for six or seven years and way better patient compliance than the traditional casts. And for me as a surgeon, it's kind of nice. God forbid I break my wrist someday. Uh, I can sterilize the cast and still operate, um, which is kind of nice. Uh, I still use plaster for fracture reductions and then I, sp I split the cast. But once the fracture is sticky, I almost always uh, build one of these um, 3D casts. I think, the, I think they're great, patients love them. Uh, for pediatrics, it's really nice. On the top right, that's one of my patients actually, that's behind my boat, he's surfing a week after his injury. And uh, that, um, that waterproof cast uh, came in super handy. And on the bottom, you can see, you know, cutting the cast off, the kids don't like it. Um, and you can lock them on. So you can have the bungees, like I showed you earlier, that you can remove the, the cast as a splint, or you can lock them on with these zip ties, uh, which is for the patients that maybe aren't as compliant. Uh, I always tell the kids that they're made of the same plastic as Legos. They like that and they can get the cool colors too. Thank you for your attention. I uh, wish I could take questions, but um, certainly welcome to contact me. Um, and I hope you have a great rest of your conference and have fun skiing and stay warm. And if you ever come to Crested Butte, this is my home. Um, come stop by and say hi. Take care. <laughs>